You may not remember this, and it's probably high time I let go of the matter, but I can't. It sticks in my throat. A few days after 9-11, Jerry Falwell went on television, and he blamed abortionists, feminists, gays, and lesbians for the attacks. Do you remember this? If you don't, I'm sorry to have to break the news to you. It was a hard thing to see. His lunacy rested on a carefully articulated theology. Falwell believed that God has absolute control of every aspect of existence, and therefore, if the attacks happened, God must have let them happen, allowed them to happen. Why would God permit such a thing? Falwell racked his mind. He stayed up night after night trying to find an answer. He thought, he agonized. No, I'm totally kidding. He didn't do any of these things. <laughs> he just asked himself, who scares me? Who do I hate with the most hateful part of my hate-filled heart? Who keeps me up at night? Then he took those feelings, threw them up onto a blank screen in the sky, expanded his prejudices infinitely, called that projection God, and bowed down before it. Kidding again. He didn't think it over for a second. He just automatically assumed that if he was afraid of someone, God must not like them, that if he hated someone, God must hate them, that if he condemned someone, God must condemn them. There wasn't a lot of thought behind his comments, just distorted religion. I heard Falwell say these things, and I couldn't stand it. I thought to myself, I wish that guy were dead. I wish he would just drop dead. Who's he to speak for God? I would, what I wanted to do was to pick Jerry Falwell up and throw him in a hole. So I don't identify with Joseph in this morning's story. Instead, I feel for his murder-minded brothers. They hated Joseph. One morning, their little brother wakes up early with a proclamation. Brothers, behold! I had a dream that you all bowed down before me. Trust me when I say that his voice in their ears did not sound as sweet as Kurt's just did in ours. <laughs> they hated him even more. Not because he was obnoxious, which he was, but because ancient Judaism believed that God communicated through dreams. In other words, Joseph was claiming to know the will of God. Even worse than that, he was claiming to be the will of God. And his brothers couldn't stand it, couldn't stand jo Joseph's claim to know the mind of God. They protested, you have got to be kidding. You're going to rule us. You know what God wants. And they hated him even more. They wanted to pick him up and throw him in a hole. You probably remember that in the 1500s, a person could make an offering to the church in order to clear a particular sin from God's ledger. You could even pay in advance on a Friday afternoon if you were planning a particularly debauched weekend. There you could go off to church, buy the indulgence, and the church then could manipulate God's mind before God even had the opportunity to make it up. Martin Luther could not stand such presumption. Isn't God free? Above everything, even the church, the Reformation began with Luther's outrage. Imagine Martin Luther fuming. Luther fumed, he hated, he protested. If the church expects Christians to place their belief in something visible rather than in the ineffable one who towers above both the temple and the tangible, well then, the church has just betrayed God. Luther was outraged. Here's what he said to the church in the height of his anger. You're like a magician who conjures gold coins into the mouths of silly people, but when they open their mouths, they have horse dung in them. What a lovely image, huh? <laughs> we don't have that inscribed underneath his picture over there on the wall, but he was angry. He was very, very angry. Luther wanted to pick the church up and throw it in a hole. So what's going on with all this anger? Well, we shouldn't get stuck here. But the rage of Joseph's brothers is a very Protestant feeling. Our 
despair over one of the princes of Protestantism, over Jerry Falwell. That's a very Protestant feeling. Luther's burning fury with the church of his day, that was a very Protestant feeling. I don't like it when a worshiper stands up and walks out in the middle of one of my sermons, but it happens, and if it happens, because that worshiper is repulsed by my confident talk about Jesus, I get it, I understand it. That's a very Protestant feeling. Sometimes I want to throw myself in a hole. The disgust we feel when confronted with another believer's claim to know the mind of God, that's a very Protestant feeling. It runs through our tradition like electricity runs through wire. And it's understandable. And it may even save our lives. Paul Tillich named it the Protestant principle. In other words, the ground rule that sits as the basis and at the heart of our tradition. Here's what Tillich said. It's printed in your bulletins, and I hope and I pray that this is the most philosophically jargon-filled quotation you ever find in a church bulletin, but bear with us for a second. Tillich said, The Protestant principle contains the divine and human protest against any absolute claim made for a relative reality. The Protestant principle contains the divine and human protest against any absolute claim made for a relative reality. Let's break that down. First, divine and human protest. What he's saying is that the revulsion I felt at Jerry Falwell was not political. I disagree with the man politically, but that was not the heart of my revulsion. Instead, I was feeling a spiritual recoil. I was feeling God recoil when I recoiled. God's majesty is offended by our presumption to understand it. Second, absolute claim. This one explains itself. Anytime a person or a church says something like this, like marriage is a gift from God, it occurs between a man and a woman, and that cannot be changed. They're making an absolute claim. They're invoking the absolute, the ultimate, the permanent, the mind of God. Finally, relative reality. That's what we're living in, the day-to-day. Our laws and rules, customs, habits, opinions, prejudices, beliefs, convictions, preaching, prayers, hymnals, even our churches, these are all relative all contingent, all historically conditioned, all products of their time and place. None of them are permanent. None of them are God. And the moment we claim that they are somehow miraculously perfectly aligned with the mind of the divine, that's the moment we risk idolatry. Or in other words, that's the moment we start worshiping ourselves So despite the philosophical jargon, what Tillich says is actually quite simple. Protestantism says no. Whenever a person, institution, or movement claims that its values are God's values, its truth, God's truth, its action, God's action. Our tradition does this in order to preserve the majesty of God, And just as importantly, in order to save humanity from our hubris and our violence. Because God is free, free from our understanding. And God is beyond, beyond our comprehension. Jesus could not be contained by the grave, and he certainly cannot be trapped inside the confines of our minds. The cross itself points to the fact that God is indescribable, inexpressible, ineffable. How do you really know someone? You really know a person when they let their guard down, when they take their armor off, when they are authentic enough to be with you and to laugh and to cry, to be silly and to be broken, even to bleed and to weep. That is how close God gets to us in Jesus. And then, right at the moment, right at the moment, 
when he's showing us precisely who he is, he negates himself. He disappears. He dies. Or as Karl Barth put it in my all-time favorite theological quote, when God reveals himself in Jesus, he discloses a mystery. Now all of this may seem wildly counterintuitive, maybe even disappointing. At some level, you come to church in order to find God. That's why I'm here anyhow. And then we get here, and our tradition says that while Christ comes to teach us everything we can know about the divine, what he teaches is confusing and mysterious and elusive. We could despair over this. And let me tell you, there are days when we should. Days when the most faithful thing a believer can do is simply rail against the mystery and shake our fists at heaven, crying out, why? Why the pain? Why the loss? Why the wretched diagnosis? Why the never-ending war? We must either be dim-witted or terminally unfeeling if we fail to grieve the fact that we cannot know the intricacies of God, and God will not give those intricacies to us. It's painful. But let me suggest that the alternative would be much, much worse. To know something completely is to control it, to command it, to make it serve our own ends. Anytime humanity saps the mystery of an object or a process, every time humanity grows to know something absolutely, we subject it to our own ends, and the result is always trouble. From the most efficient way to farm a chicken to the cheapest way to sew a pair of tennis shoes to the secrets of the atom, we are bright enough to take the mysteries of existence, flatten them out, iron them out, and make them serve our needs, and the result is always havoc, even though havoc is rarely our intention. We take existence and we squeeze the mystery out of it. Imagine then the horror that humanity would unleash if we were able to master the mind of God. Consider all the blood that has been shed by those who think they have, by medieval crusaders who thought they knew the mind of God, by contemporary terrorists who believe they are the agents of heaven. They're all wrong, of course, But even something as flimsy as bloodlust projected onto heaven and then confused for the will of God, even something that transparently obvious is powerful enough to tear the world apart. Perhaps this is why God let us fall, why she built our weakness right into the system. Maybe God made Adam and Eve so stupid as to eat the apple because their brilliance contained such danger. And so they fell. And so we are born with an inability to achieve or even receive true, absolute knowledge of God. What I'm trying to say is that we're protected by the fact that God is mystery. So instead of longing for knowledge of God, perhaps we ought to receive God's reticence as a gift. Some days God seems so taciturn and distant. Maybe we ought to receive God's seemingly taciturn distance as a gift, not an affliction. Emil Bruner, the theologian Emil Bruner, captured this idea perfectly. In the 1930s, When the Nazis came to power in Germany, they quickly conscripted almost every aspect of the German church, and they did so by simply pulling out the theme I'm warning against this morning, the theme Protestantism warns against. They did so by encouraging the church to understand the rise of Hitler as the will of God. If it was happening, God must have wanted it to happen. Therefore, one could see the mind of God in the ever-growing power that the Nazis had. Now, it didn't work to such evil ends elsewhere, but this is a common phenomenon. Benjamin Franklin subscribed to it. 
At the earliest days of the rise of America, Franklin said about God, if he knows when a sparrow falls, certainly he blesses the rise of an empire. It's a tempting way to think, and it proves disastrous. Here's what Bruner said. You're wrong. Even Jesus Christ is an indirect communication, for direct communication is paganism. Direct communication cannot communicate the message of God, but only that of an idol, of an idol, of the little gods with a small g that we craft in our own minds, make in our own image, and then send off to do our often horrendous errands. Those are the gods we can know inside out and backwards. It's no accident that those who are absolutely certain of their direct line of communication with God are always the first to bless our world's wars and draw the bloody sword. They're not worshiping God. They are making a God out of their own opinions. All of which is to say that I'm very glad you're joining the church today. Because here in an age when it seems the only options for people who think deeply, the only options are either atheism, and you all have friends who subscribe to atheistic or at best a sort of wavering agnosticism, right? The only options are either atheism or absolute religious certainty. So if you wake up one morning and you feel that something is happening in your heart that is profound and you need a place to take it, or if you wake up one morning and suddenly you've had a baby and you need some place to take and shape that child, the options it seems our culture is giving us are plain. Do it on your own. What you see is what you get. There's nothing hovering above the clouds. Or churches that traffic in absolute certainty. Those are your only choices. Maybe a third choice. You can walk along the shore of Lake Michigan and feel something warm happen in your heart. That doesn't get you very far, I don't think. But those are the choices we have. So Chicago needs a church like ours. The world needs a church like ours. A church that is audacious enough to gather in the name of Christ and humble enough to confess that we don't really know what we're talking about. Now that, as I've said before, is not a phrase to hang on a banner and mount on the side of the church. (laughs) God is still speaking sounds much better than we don't have a clue. (laughs) But there is such value in our cluelessness, in our humility, in our tradition's claim that what we don't know is immense. Protestantism insists, stop talking. Don't say too much. You cannot capture God with your words or your minds. Or as Bonhoeffer put it, teaching about Christ must begin in silence. Amen.